Hey, before this service begins, we just want to say thank you for making this service a part of your experience today. Whether you're watching it on a Sunday live or later on, we are praying that God would use something in this service, in this message, to bless and minister to you. And we want to hear about that. If God is using something in this service, in this video, to minister to you, would you do us a favor? Would you email me today online at cccomaha.org so we can celebrate how God is using this in your life? And uh, if you're new here today, that's what we've been doing for the last eight weeks now at Christ Community, is we've been talking about how to experience God. And I think that it's poetic that, <laughs> that this week we've had to adjust our services. Uh, you know, Steve and the team made the right call in uh, having to change our Christmas concert into a little carol thing that's going on here at this time, but they had to make adjustments in order to be able to do that. I've had to adjust for the sermon, and some of you are having to adjust your expectations of what's going to happen here this morning. Uh, I know that there's some people here who the reason you came is because you were expecting the concert to hit. And uh, maybe even the only reason you came is because Aunt Hazel was going to be singing in the choir, and now there's no Aunt Hazel, and you're going, what in the world am I doing here? And I want to suggest this morning maybe a change in expectations that instead of just sitting in perpetual disappointment, that perhaps you would say, you know, why would God change my world in such a way that I wound up in church today? And might he have something that's there for my life? Because I find that whenever God begins to adjust our external circumstances outside of our control, it's oftentimes because he's got a plan for us that we would never invent for ourselves. You guys tracking what I'm saying here? This is the kind of thing that God does normally, so whenever you're in that situation where you go, okay, I was expecting this, but I got that, the first question that should come to mind is, what does God have planned in this moment that I never would have planned for myself? And if I could make the suggestion that you would open yourself up and say, God, what do you have for me today? Uh, you might discover something really cool. Because all of us are on a spiritual journey. And that spiritual journey takes place at all different places of your spiritual maturity. So you might be somebody who's brand new to the faith or even just exploring the faith. You might be somebody who's been around for a long time. You might be somebody who is young and you're just figuring out how to adjust your life. You might be somebody who's old as a fossil and uh, you're experienced, but God's not done with you yet. And if God's not done with you yet, that means you're going to continue to need to make adjustments to your life that are different than the things that you expected. So in order for us to get into this mindset of adjustments, I want you all to imagine your 16-year-old self. All right, you guys go in there? 16-year-old self. I know that for some of the kids in the room, you're imagining a future self, a world of driver's licenses in high school and pure joy. And uh, some of you are having to go like way back to the world of Julius Caesar when you were a teenager. And uh, you think that through. So you got the picture in your mind? Got a, got a picture? I picture myself, my sophomore year school picture, wearing a light blue polo, looking something like this. Yeah, look at that young man. That was two years before my prison sentence and mugshot. Yeah. <laughs> There wasn't really a prison sentence, but, you know, the mullet. Isn't the mullet rocking there? That was about six inches before I cut it off, and uh, beautiful look there. Uh, I remember in high school, there were things that gave me great stress. Analytic geometry gave me great stress in uh, not junior high, in high school. Uh, and things that gave me great joy, like my 1976 Ford LTD. Nicknamed the Beast from East. It was great. I loved my car. And of course, I obsessed over high school sports. Uh, I was a gymnast in high school. Some of you have never believed that a gargantuan individual like myself could ever climb on a pommel horse. But there we have picture, pictorial evidence right there. It really is true. It happened. Thank you. I got one clap. There we go. A little bit more uh, pictorial evidence that's right there that I used to swing pommel horse. And did you notice, like, I had a man perm at the time. I mean, man perms were cool in 1985. I say this because God invites us to make adjustments at all ages, and the heroes of our text this week are teenagers. 
They're somewhere between 14 and 18 years old, and they're having to make major adjustments to your life. So I want you to picture your 16-year-old self as you go back to the world of Nazareth, into the bedroom of a guy by the name of Joseph and God's plans for adjusting his life. It says this. This is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet didn't want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All right, let's unpack this uh, for a moment here because uh, Joseph is an all-star. Uh, Joseph is a man of integrity. Joseph is a teenager who gets a vision at night. And up until this point, he thought that the high integrity path would be not to marry Mary because she tells him, okay, Joseph, I'm pregnant and <laughs> it's by the Holy Spirit. Really, no guys were involved at all. And you can imagine being Joseph and being like, look, Mary, you're cute, but I think maybe it was that Elijah Jacobson. You've always thought he was pretty cute. And because he was kind, he said, I'm not going to do anything to publicly disgrace you, but just quietly, I'm going to walk off the scene because he wanted to do the right thing uh, according to the law and the right thing to do. But he didn't believe her. You see, Joseph, in our experience in God paradigm, was at the crisis of belief stage. He's asking himself the question, can I even believe that the God of the universe would get a teenage girl pregnant? And he walked away saying no until he got the vision at night. And when God communicates to us, that changes everything, amen? I mean, when God tells you something, you are compelled to obey what he tells you to do. And so he gets this vision that comes at night. I want to unpack the vision a little bit. It starts off with his name, Joseph. You know, if an angel ever comes in, knows your name at night, you know the message is for you. Joseph, and then he says, son of David. Now, this is funky because Joseph's dad's name isn't David. Son of David is kind of, it's more of a title than it is a name. And why it's significant is that in the ancient uh, Middle East or in ancient Israel, everybody knew that when the Messiah was going to come on the scene, he would have to be of the lineage of David. There was a promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that said it would be in David's line that the Messiah would come. So the only people that could be the father of the Messiah would be people who have got David in their lineage. And the angels point that out right away. Hey, Joseph, son of David, he's about to drop the Messiah announcement on him and he wants him to know that you are a legitimate candidate for receiving the Messiah into your family, Joseph, son of David. And then he says to him, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Now this phrase, do not be afraid, is repeated four different times in the birth narrative and dozens of times in the Bible. Do not be afraid. What would Joseph be afraid of? Joseph, do, do not be afraid for your reputation. Do not be afraid about the gossip that's going to go on about you and Mary and where this baby came from, because that gossip would happen. Do not be afraid that people are going to call your boy a manzer for the rest of your life. You know, in every culture, there's a word for somebody who you don't know who his father is. In English, that word starts with a B, but in Hebrew, the word is manzer. The angel says, don't, don't be afraid, Joseph. Don't be afraid of how you'll provide for her. Don't be afraid of what's going to happen in your future. Don't be afraid of anything. Just take that scared little girl to be your wife and love her and take care of her and protect her. 
Because what's going on inside of her body really is a miracle of God. It really is of the Holy Spirit. So stop right here and think about what Joseph's going to have to do as a result of this. Joseph is going to need to make a major adjustment in his life according to what God has done inside of Mary. He takes on this disgraced teenager. He's going to be a disappointment to his parents, a disappointment to his city, but God calls him to do it anyway. And the angel says to him, oh yeah, I've already got a name for the baby too. Your job is to name the baby Jesus or Yeshua. Which means in Hebrew, God is salvation. Why? Because he's going to save the world from their sins. Now, this is a good news moment, isn't it? Like, Joseph, the son that you're going to raise is going to save your people from their sins. There's really no better assignment to be able to get in the world. Your son's going to save people from their sins. And that would make it all worthwhile for Joseph. All the pain that goes along the way to know what the end result would be, that would make it all worthwhile. But wait a minute, because we need to realize that Joseph is not actually ever going to see that take place, at least not while he's on planet Earth, because this saving Israel from their sins really wouldn't happen for another 30 plus years. And most people think that Joseph died somewhere between the time that Jesus was 12 and the time that he was 30. I mean, not only is it a normal time to die in the ancient world, but we see Joseph very clearly in the narrative of Jesus teaching at the temple when he was 12 years old, and Joseph is nowhere to be seen anywhere in the narratives about Jesus and the Gospels of what happened when Jesus was in his early 30s. So most scholars think that Joseph died during that time. What does that mean? That means that Joseph died without ever getting to see the adult Jesus, without ever getting to see the miracles, without ever getting to see the claims, the controversy, the death and resurrection of Jesus and Israel being saved from all of their sins. He had to walk in faith, live by sacrifice, and never be able to get to see the fruit of what he was doing. Now I say that because some of you are in the same boat. You're walking in obedience to God, And you're not seeing the end results of it yet. You're in the middle of the hard times. You're doing things like maintaining integrity in the middle of an ugly divorce. Or paying off debt rather than claiming bankruptcy. Or showing up daily to a job that you hate in order to just provide for your family. And you're asking God, God, can, can I just get to see the fruit of my life's work? And I want to let you know in advance the answer to that question is maybe, maybe. Because some people live in obedience to God and they get to see what happens at the end. Some people walk in obedience to God and never see the results of it. Joseph was one of those people who never got to see the end result of his obedience to God. And sometimes the investment of our life is not something that we get to see the miraculous fruit from it. It's that kid that we raise that gets to see the fruit. It's the person that we disciple who changes the world. It's the obedience that our obedience inspires that makes a major change in this world. But we act in faith. We respond in obedience. We treat people with great love because we trust that obeying God is worth it. We obey God either way. So let's peek in on Joseph again and see how did Joseph respond to this. Chapter 1, verse 24 says this. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary as his wife. Good job, Joseph. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son And then he gave him the name Jesus, just like the angel commanded. But I want to pause for a moment on that idea that he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. I mean, he's honoring the whole idea that this is a God-inspired virgin birth, so he resists the temptation to consummate the marriage for, let's say, seven months. 
Imagine being a hormone-driven teenage boy and resisting the urge for seven months. This is a man of integrity, amen? I mean, I've always said that engagement is the hardest time in boy-girl relationships because you get all of the responsibilities and none of the benefits. You guys know what I'm talking about up in the balcony up there? <laughs> all the responsibilities and none of the benefits. That's one of the reasons I'm pro-short engagements. Well, Josiah, not Josiah, <laughs> yeah, there's an engaged guy right there, yeah, here, here. Well, Joseph takes it a step further because he was actually married to the girl and he was resisting in order to honor God. Joseph is an all-star in the obedience category and he obeyed in giving the name Jesus and he didn't know the sacrifice that he was going to have to take. He had already given God his yes no matter what the call was and he found out a few months later that part of that meant traveling to Bethlehem with a nine month along pregnant wife. Now this is a 63 mile journey as the crow flies from Nazareth to Bethlehem. But if you take the windy mountain path that's the most direct way there, it's a 75 mile journey. And if you decide to take the black line, the valley route, it winds up being a 90 mile journey, although flatter to get there. And no matter which way you go, there is a net elevation change of 2,500 feet. So you're going uphill many miles with a nine month long pregnant wife. This is not an easy journey for Joseph, but he takes it. And what Joseph didn't know is that after the baby was born, it was going to get even harder because as soon as Herod found out that a king had been born in Bethlehem, he ordered that all of the babies there be killed. And that meant that Mary and Joseph had to flee and eventually become refugees in Egypt where Joseph would have to raise Jesus for a number of years as a foreigner who didn't know the language in a different country. This was not what Joseph imagined his life being, but he walked in obedience to God. So we love Joseph as the example of doing this in the ancient world, but what does it look like today to hear the voice of God and make an adjustment to your life in order to be able to respond to him? We already heard a good story earlier from Linda. We've had another story that we've ramped up on video of Mike and Mark and the way that they're adjusting their lives to obey God. Check this out. My name is Mark Carlson. Uh, my wife and I have been here for about 12 years. My name is Mike Fursina. Um, I've been at CCC for oh, eight years. Or so. so last year in June, when, when I had an opportunity to go to Miami, my primary uh, goal was to support and lift up the people at Envision Miami. Doing uh, uh, ESL um, classes, providing uh, food distribution to the community, um, particularly during uh, COVID times to work with the team that was already there and try to find a way to augment or help. So when the team was formed to go to Envision Miami uh, in June, I got to meet uh, Mark Carlson. Mike and I were doing some painting one day. Uh, the rest of the group was doing some other projects. And uh, as we were painting, we, we said, you know, gee, it's too bad that uh, there isn't more time that we can accomplish more things around here because there are a lot of projects that that require somebody with um, with some skills, not necessarily a lot of skills. So when we came back, Mark and I recognized that there were other things that needed to be done that we just didn't have time to do. So having a conversation with Mark offline was, was hey, would it be great if we could put a team together and go down and, and work together again? Uh, we brought it up to our team leader, and we also brought it up to Matt, Matt Barotto. And uh, we certainly received encouragement in that, so uh, that's where we began the process and uh, were ultimately asked to be the, the co-team leaders of, of this group. You know, in going through the uh, Experiencing God series, I've been looking at the, the, the different uh, different lessons that we've been going through, and there's one especially that hit me, 
there was a, a phrase or a statement there that said, when you see the Father at work around you, that's your invitation to adjust your life to Him and join Him in that work. You know, one of the beauties of, of being retired or semi-retired as I am uh, is that I do have some flexibility in my schedule. And uh, when we see things that we can do, uh, it's wonderful to be able to jump in and, and actually do them. You know, going back to Miami in January, I have, I have you know, mixed feelings about uh, I know it's going to be hard. We're going to do a lot in four days. But during the four days, we anticipate uh, helping, finishing, uh, accomplishing some great things that, that need to be done on the campus, whether it's just painting or hammering or whatever it is. Uh, the satisfaction of knowing that what we do, uh, what our team accomplishes, will actually further the kingdom. And that's a great feeling. That's, that's, it's, it, it is exciting to, to know that you can be a part of what God's doing. Let's give it up for those guys. Come on. <laughs> guys who are about doing justice and loving mercy and giving the tools that they have for the sake of the kingdom of God. And that's just an ordinary story of people who are saying, I will give my life in order to be able to do what God has invited me into, to go into a new adventure. And one of the things that strikes me about the stories that we have today, whether it's Linda or Mike and Mark or the story you're going to hear later, is that the people who tell the stories are just very ordinary people. Like they are regular Omaha people who are filled by the Holy Spirit asking, God, what do you want to do in my life? And it's when thousands of people join together to say, I will do the little thing that God is calling me to, that the kingdom of God comes in power and that culture changes family by family, neighborhood by neighborhood, workplace by workplace. And God needs all kinds of people, upfront people, behind the scenes people. He needs people who are singers, people who are carpenters. He invites us in according to who we are to do what he's called us to do on this adventure that we've talked about as experiencing God. Now, it doesn't start with adjusting your life. Let me do a little bit of a, uh, take a few steps backwards and give you the broader paradigm of what we're talking about. So in our diagram, you may remember that it starts off with the idea of God is at work all around you. So our job is discover where God is at work and obey him. That's the top line going across there. That's the summary of the whole of experiencing God. Discover where God is at work and obey him. But if you take the long path down below, you've got God's in a loving relationship with you. He's shown his love through Jesus. He loves you more than anything. And he invites you to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in return. And in that context, he invites you to join him in what he's doing in this world. And I love what Mark said in that video where he said, recognizing God's work around you is your invitation to join him. So they recognize, wow, here's a place that God's at work. I'm going to join in what God is doing. And then God speaks to us. He affirms his call through prayer and circumstances, through the Bible, through the church. And as he does that, it creates a moment where there is a crisis of belief. Am I actually going to believe what God said or not? And if you say, yes, I believe, it moves towards an adjustment in your life. So our key idea for today, point number six is articulated this way. You must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he's doing. You can't just stay static and obey God at the same time. Now, this might mean that you include somebody new in your life. Somebody new from your marketplace, somebody new at school, a, an Afghan refugee. It might mean that you pack up and move to a new city. It might mean that you take on a leadership challenge, like leading a community group. It might mean that you start a business or join the orchestra. It might mean that you get a degree or adopt a baby. It might mean giving up a sin or reconciling a relationship. It might mean finding your identity deeply formed in Jesus, but you need to ingest this truth. You cannot stay where, you're, where you are and go with God. This is so important. Go ahead and read this out loud with me. You ready? You cannot stay where you are and go with God. 
You can't be static and moving all at the same time. Whenever you're going to adjust your life, it requires risk. It's never placid or safe. It will remake you into something beautiful and help you to become like Jesus, but you can't stay in the same place and become something new all at the same time. I think one of the most amazing things about God is that he loves you right where you're at, but he loves you so much that he won't leave you stuck there. He wants to engage you for the person that you are and then move you to new places, and that requires adjustments. Now, as I've thought about that, there are certain people in this world who are really good at adjustments and people who are bad at adjustments. Christians who would say, anytime God asks me to adjust, it's an easy decision for me. And people who, whenever God asks them to adjust, it is a major crisis and a wrestling and a stress bucket for them. What's the difference between these two people? What's the one key factor that makes it easy to adjust whenever God asks you to? It's summarized in this. The key to adjustments is the Lordship of Christ. It's the Lordship of Christ. It's making a decision at some point in your life who is going to be in charge. Because if Jesus is in charge, and this is a resolved issue, then when Jesus asks you to make adjustments, it's an easy thing. You just say, yes, Lord, and move on with your life. But here's something that oftentimes happens in Christian circles, is that whether it's because of a sermon or a culture that you're in the midst of, you get invited to receive Jesus as your savior, but not your Lord. Sometimes the message that's proclaimed is something like, hey, if you just pray the prayer, God will forgive your sins, and then your job is just to kind of coast, live a moral life, go to church until the day that you die and wind up going to heaven. And if you do that, that's success. But this is not the gospel that Jesus taught. Jesus taught the gospel that there is a kingdom that's coming. He's the new king. He's in charge of the kingdom. And when you come to him, it's a package deal. Yes, he saves you from your sins, but also he demands everything of you. He requires that he would be your Lord as well as your savior. In fact, there were certain points of frustration that Jesus would say to his disciples, why do you say to me, Lord, Lord, and then don't do what I say? If Jesus is your Lord then he's in charge of everything he's inviting you into. Now, in our culture, in the church in general, there is oftentimes lordship confusion. What I mean by that is people are confused by who's really in charge of my life because the natural human tendency is that we want to be in charge of our lives. But the truth of the matter is when people are in charge of their own lives, they universally make a mess of things. God's smarter than you. And if God's smarter than you, it's just smart of us to be able to put him in charge of our lives and allow him to be the one who is in control of everything that we do. Now, they had lordship confusion in Jesus' lifetime as well. In the emperor world, there was a guy who came on the scene by the name of Octavian. He was adopted by Julius Caesar, and Julius gave him the name Augustus. You know what Augustus means? Great. Venerable, worthy of reverence. And Augustus liked that name. It's an insinuation that he was deity, that he was worthy of worship, that Caesar is Lord. And this was a favorite phrase of the military, Caesar is Lord in their day. Further, since his adopted dad, Julius Caesar, was called Divus Lulius, the divine Julius, Augustus was known as Divi Filius, the son of God, a title that Augustus Caesar embraced. Coins issued by Augustus featured his image in the inscriptions such as divine Caesar, son of God. And an Egyptian inscription calls Augustus Caesar a star shining with the brilliance of the great heavenly savior, Are you guys seeing the connections in the language here? At the time, they called Caesar Lord, Son of God, and Savior. No wonder they had lordship confusion at the time. Who's really in charge in this planet? Who's really in charge in my life? 
And can I say that I still see lordship confusion happening even in the political arena with us today? I mean, sometimes I see Christians putting posts up on Facebook that demonstrate that there is a large amount of emotion that's behind their passion related to their political party, be it elephants or donkeys. It betrays that there is some lordship confusion that's going on behind the scenes, that their hope is not in Jesus, their hope is in government, and this is a huge mistake because the truth of the matter is Jesus is God, Jesus is our Savior, Jesus is our our Lord. Somebody say amen. Amen. When you get this straight, it becomes much easier to sort through your life. And Luke, when he wrote the birth narrative about Jesus, wanted to make really, really sure by the language that he used that people didn't have lordship confusion from the beginning. Did you notice that the only place in the Bible that Caesar Augustus is mentioned is in Luke chapter two, when it talks about the census that called Mary and Joseph away. But just after he mentions the name of Caesar Augustus, Luke is telling the birth story in such a way that Christ is seen as the true possessor of the titles that were claimed by Augustus. It is not Augustus who is Savior and Lord, but instead Luke says, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the what? Christ the, he's Christ the Lord. From the moment that he comes onto the planet, he's stealing Caesar Augustus' titles, Savior and Lord. It is not Caesar, but Jesus, who is the Son of God. If you resolve this issue, who's the Lord of my life? Then you walk to God every single day with open hands, and you say, really, truly, God, my life is yours. My time is yours. My vocation is yours. My home is yours. My future is yours. My money is yours. My kids are yours. So you may ask the question, if if I give all of this to God, what happens if he asks for it? What happens if he asks me to take my life in a different direction? What happens if he calls me to go to a place that I consider to be unsafe? Should I do what God calls me to do? People have oftentimes considered their lives, their finances, their dreams, and asked, what if God invites me to take these things away? Somebody who has the lordship issue resolved simply gives their yes in advance, even if it's uncomfortable or unsafe. I know some parents who have asked the question, what if God calls me to do something unsafe and my kids are involved in that call? Are my kids obligated to go with my call as well? Or what if God calls my kids to do something that I consider to be unsafe, like go to the mission field? Friends, let me remind you of this saying, that there is no safer place in the world than the center of God's will. And there's no safer place in the world for your kids than the center of God's will. If God runs the world, if God invented the universe, if God has done everything to redeem us and save us, is there any better place to be than exactly the place that God has called us to? And there is no safety issue, no sacrifice issue, no persecution issue that should be so precious to us that we wouldn't give it up for the sake of the gospel. Because God has invited us in, and God can be trusted more than you trust yourself. So, for eight weeks, we've been studying. We've been listening to God. We've been finding out where he's working so that we can join him. And I want to ask you this big question right now. What's God been saying to you for the last eight weeks? Where can you join him? What needs to be adjusted in your life in order to do the right thing to enjoy God? Because you can trust him and his promises are good. Let's hear one more story today. This one from Lee and Jill who are on an adventure with God and have been required to adjust their life. Uh, We started in uh, Lee and Jim's community group Um, I think the first year they started it, they were in Bennington. We lived in Bennington, 
And so uh, we, we just love our group. I think the experience in God has just been tremendous. I've done it before, but this time it seems that I'm getting more out of it even than the first time. And, and I think it's because of the community that we're doing it with. So it's really good to talk about the questions in the sermons. I had been at a uh, Embrace the Nations meeting on a Monday night, and Pam Franks, who's the director of Embrace the Nations, had mentioned that Julie was going to be um, welcoming an Afghan family, and we didn't know when that week. Uh, and so I texted Julie the next day and just asked her if there was anything that I could do to help her out. And so she texted a list back of some items, some furnishings and just kitchen items and clothing, winter coats that they were going to need. And uh, so Jill and I went shopping, had a blast <laughs> buying winter coats for the family. And so then we went to the airport that evening, that same evening that we bought the coats, to greet them and to welcome them uh, to Omaha. And they just fell into our arms. We, we just hugged, you know, the women and, of course, shook hands with the men. And um, we just said, you're so, we're so glad that you're here. We were just so excited to be able to do that. And I think for me, greeting them at the airport was that peace that um, I knew that this was a family that I didn't want to just have it be a meeting at the airport and then never uh, spend time with them again. Uh, when the family came off, we were all clapping and, mm -hmm. and yelling welcome. And when the mother hugged me, mm -hmm. um, she clung to me mm -hmm. and she just started weeping. And, and then I started weeping and um, I realized that um, I wanted them to thrive in Omaha, not just, not just get by, but really thrive. You know, God's at work around us, all around us, every day. We just don't always have eyes to see it. And I guess I've been praying just that, that he would open my eyes to the work he's doing. And I feel like he's done that. And I look at the Old Testament and time and time again, he talks about the foreigner uh -huh. and the stranger and the alien and how we are to treat them. That was really the start. It was like, I heard about Julie helping this family and it was like, okay, God's working there. I know Julie, how can I help her? Uh -huh. And then, um, <laughs> and then about a week into it, because Julie's so busy with Global Friends, she said, I'm, I'm handing, <laughs> handing this off to you. And I think that was probably my crisis of faith because I wouldn't have picked me to be a point person. I'm more of a come alongside kind of person. Um, and so God has really been growing and stretching me and um, developing some gifts that I didn't, I don't have. It's from him. Um, and so I was telling Jill the other day, in the last month, I have felt alive in a way that I don't know that I've experienced before. And I think it's because of realizing that you know, God had prepared works for me to do before the foundation of the world. And this is part of that. And to be able to um, join him in that, you know, kind of like Moses, I, I think you've got the wrong person, yeah. you know. Um, and he's, he's like, well, I'm, I'm choosing you, so follow me. We had really nothing to offer an Afghan family who came here except the love of Christ, which we have experienced for ourselves and we want to offer to them. And um, so, you know, as Lee had said earlier, um, God speaks through all the Old Testament about the refugee, about the foreigner, about the, the uh, alien. And we just feel like here they are. Why not? Go with God and 
and see what he's going to do. And we're just praying that he brings them to himself. Hey, it's Alex here again. If you made it this far in the video, thank you for engaging with us online. And that means hopefully that you have heard or experienced God in some way through the message or through the service today. And I would really love it if you would take time to share that with us because that helps us celebrate how God is using our online ministry to reach people in whatever capacity that they're engaging in. And so would you do me a favor? Would you just take a moment, if God is ministering to you through this, to let me know how, you can email online at cccomaha.org or you can even drop a comment wherever you're watching. Or if you're on YouTube right now, you can click that subscribe button and, and click the bell to get notifications for whenever we drop new content online. But seriously, we are praying about this ministry. We're hoping that God is using this and we want to help you take your best next step wherever that is and wherever in the world you are. We hope to see you soon.